just uh, snuffed out, but obviously there's something else going on uh, in, uh, in the system. Uh, but uh, I'm going to pray that uh, the feed gets through and the word of God uh, is able to, to be properly discerned this day. Turn with me, if you will, uh, to the book of Exodus, Exodus 23. Uh, I apologize for my voice. I'm not sure it wasn't, ha wasn't having problems until I got this mic in front of me, but, uh, you know, it's okay. Uh, We're we going to get the word out anyway. Amen. Exodus 23, I want to begin our study today at verse 20. I declare it's going to bless you. It blessed me. It'll bless you. Here's what the Lord says. Behold, I send an angel before you to guard you on the way and bring you to the place that I have prepared. Pay careful attention to him and obey his voice. Do not rebel against him, for he will not pardon your transgressions, for my name, watch this, is in him. But if you carefully obey his voice and do all that I say, then I will be an enemy to your enemies and an adversary to your adversaries. When my angel goes before you and brings you to the Amorites and the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Canaanites and the Hivites and the Jebusites, I will blot them out. You shall not bow down to their gods, nor serve them, nor do as they do, but you shall utterly overthrow them and break their pillars in pieces. You shall serve the Lord your God, and he will bless your bread and your water. Watch this. I will take sickness away from among you. None shall miscarry or be barren in your land. I will fulfill the number of your days. I will send my terror before you and will throw into confusion all the people against whom you shall come. And I will make all your enemies turn their backs to you. And I will send hornets before you, which shall drive out the Hittites and the Canaanites and the Hittites before you. I will not, watch this, drive them out from before you in one year. Watch this. Lest the land become desolate and the wild beasts multiply against you. Little by little, I will drive them out from before you until you have increased and possess the land. This morning I want to talk from the subject God's going to do it little by little. Mm. Last week um, in, in, in preaching, um, I, one of the things that I, I shared with you was that God does not always give us the full blessing at once. That there are certain situations, certain times in which God gives us the blessing bit by bit. And I know theologically there were some folks who were saying, no, no, God doesn't do it that way. God. So I said, okay, let me, let me just give you some scripture on this. And, I, and so I wanted you to, 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 to walk with me through this, this passage because there are times in our lives when God literally has to give us the blessing bit by bit. And, I, and, and, and let me just go ahead and preface uh, by saying that the issue is not with the blessing or the blessor. God can give it all at once. The blessing is available for us to have all at once. The issue is that we're not ready to receive it all at once. And so that, that's why I want to probe this thought a little more deeply. I want us to spend this time uh, in this uh, portion of scripture in Exodus 23. Because on the one hand, God is clear that he's giving his people victory. It, it's very clear in the passage that, that he's going to give his people the victory. But on the other hand, God is also making it clear that the victory is going to come in stages. 
And again, this is not a, an issue of God's ability. The problem is that, that the text discloses to us that the people aren't quite prepared to receive the gift. It, it's, a, it, it's a preparedness issue. What good is it? And that's, that's where I want to spend our time. What good is it for God to give his people something they're not prepared to handle? See, I can say I'm ready. But, but, but the truth of, 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 of readiness is seen in how well I'm able to handle what God gives me. Matter of fact, let me just go ahead and throw it out there ahead of time before I, before I even get, get to the portion of, of text. But, but is there anybody in here that can look back on some stuff you thought you were ready for, but when you got it, you found out you wasn't quite ready? <laughs> That's where the passage takes us. And so I want to show you three things. It's, it's a lot of passage, but I want to show us three things from the passage this morning. The first thing is that God wants to direct our steps. God wants to direct our steps. God says, behold, I send an angel before you to guard you on the way and to bring you to the place I have prepared. Pay careful attention to him, obey his voice, do not rebel against him, for he will not pardon your transgressions, for my name is in him. God's plan to bring his, his people to the place of promise involved giving them this place. Their identity would literally be seen uh, within the place because the place itself would carry their name. The question was, how would God do it? God had already shown his ability to deliver by bringing his people out of bondage in Egypt. Now the question is, how would God give them the land of promise? This is the providence of God at work. That's what this, this passage deals with, is the providence of God. God is literally declaring in advance that this is what I am going to do on your behalf. He says, I'm sending an angel. But then the question becomes, what are angels? Angels are, are created spiritual beings who possess power and ability that is greater than, than human. Angels exist in the spirit realm with God and exist to serve his purpose, of which there are at least three in the Bible. Let me, let me tell you all three. First, God has magnifying angels for worship. Secondly, God has mighty angels for warring. Finally, God has ministering angels for work. What we see here in this passage is God's mighty angels for warring. Literally, God says, I am sending an angel on your behalf to clear the way. I don't want you to miss the fact that God is sending the angel before them. The angel would lead the way. He would go ahead of the people, not merely go along with them. The people. I don't want you to miss it because the angel went before them to do what he could not do beside them. I don't want y'all to miss that. The angel went before them to do what he could not do beside them. I don't want you to miss this because what this text helps me to understand is that because we are people who carry big egos, sometimes God has to go ahead of us because otherwise we try to claim it for ourselves. God says, my name is in him. That meant that the essential nature and power of God were being made known in and through the angel. The angel was on assignment. He was carrying the very essence of God 
with him as the people of God were being led. God, God literally was declaring that my, my presence is being made known to you through the angel in whom my name is being carried. God was in the angel in the same way that he was present in the pillars of cloud and the pillar of fire. Remember that the pillar of cloud and fire always went before the people. And it went before the people to lead them on the path that God would have them to go. From beginning to end, the journey to the promised land was not intended to be a journey of accident. This journey would see, would have them see and experience the hand of God at work through every phase of the journey. Now, here's, here's the thing I don't want you to miss because there's a difference between the pillar of fire and the pillar of cloud leading the people and the angel leading the people because remember, I told you that this angel is God's warring angel and so he is leading the people because he's fighting on behalf of the people. The angel of God, the angel of Yahweh would both guard the people and he would bring the people. I don't want you to miss that. He was going to guard them, and he's also going to bring them. The, the, the special emphasis here is on God's presence. The promises are always God saying that I will be with you right there every step of the way. You won't have to worry about a thing because I will be there from the beginning in the conquest. I will be there to fight on your behalf. I will be there to enable you to settle in to the land. I don't want you to miss this because this promise is in Exodus 23. This is God telling his people at the beginning of the journey, this is what I am going to do, and this is how I am going to do it. On the way, I'm going to be with you. When you get there, I'm going to be with you. When you dwell there, I'm going to be with you. God's promise was, uh, presence was assured to his people that they needed to learn to think in terms of his presence being with them, not sometimes, but at all times. As just, and just as God was giving providence to the children of Israel about their destiny, God calls on each one of us to take hold to our destiny. God wants us to take a, a place to a place that, that we haven't seen before. God wants to bring us into a place of destiny that we have yet to experience. But here's the good news. We don't have to find that place by ourselves. God has ordained that an angel watch over our steps. Can I tell you this morning that true spiritual alignment causes us to look for God in every situation. I know that we, 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 we certainly look for God when there's trouble knocking on our doors, but but, but spiritual alignment causes me to look for God no matter what the situation is. Even when, when, when things don't seem to be on track, what I need to know is that God is always present. I've said it to you before. I'll say it to you again. Even when you can't see him or sense him, you've got to know that God is always present on the scene. I believe that there, there's a deep sense of God in the path to destiny. The question is, is, are we focused more on the destination or are we focused on God? When we focus our attention on, on the destiny, we can make the mistake of stepping ahead of God. I don't want y'all to miss that. Because sometimes there's a spiritual danger in God revealing to us that where we're going. Because at the end of the day, if we're not careful, we will make the mistake of trying to step ahead of God. God says, this is where I'm going. But listen, if you're going to get there, you've got to follow me. Let me remind you that the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire 
were intended to lead God's people to the promised land. They knew what the destination was. They didn't know how they were going to get there. Now God is telling them that they are to follow the angel that will lead them to victory. Even after you get to your destination, don't make the mistake of trying to step ahead of God. What I'm telling you this morning is that when God has ordained a promise for your life when providence is what God has declared over your life. The worst mistake you can ever make is to try to step ahead of God. I thought about that this morning, and I thought about uh, how David is anointed to be the next king of Israel. David is anointed to be the next king of, of Israel. Matter of fact, if you, if you read the story, David has a hundred times the anointing that Saul has. But when David is anointed to be the next king, he knows what his destiny is. He knows what his destination is. But he also knows that I've got to do it in God's timing. I cannot step ahead of, of God. And so when David is anointed king, he doesn't go to the palace and tell Saul, your time is ended. No. He goes back into the fields and starts walking over the flock all over again because he does not want to step ahead of God. I don't know who this is for this morning, but you better learn how to hold your peace until the Lord opens up the door for you. You got to make sure that where you're going is where God has ordained and when God has ordained for it to take place. The second thing the text shows us is that God wants to deliver us from struggles. Listen to what he says, when, when, when my angels go before you and bring you to the Ambrites, Hittites, Perizzites, and the, the Canaanites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, I will blot them out. You shall not bow down to their gods, nor serve them, nor do as they do, but you shall utterly overthrow them and break their pillars in pieces. It's a very clear statement. God is saying, I'm going to wipe them out. I'm going to get rid of them. That's, that, that's what God is saying. You don't even have to worry about doing a whole lot of battles, a whole lot of fighting. Matter of fact, God, God says later on, I'm going to send hornets to run them out. Literally, God says, I'm going to bring terror but the question that the text begs is this. God promises to blot out the enemies in verse 23. If God has the power to do it, why is God delaying the promise? The reality is often delays that we count uh, towards our destiny are really God's plan to develop our disposition. God says, this is your destiny, but until you get to the right place, I can't give it to you. There are some things I could never appreciate about God were it not for the path God has placed my life on. God, God knew his people needed extra strength, so he continually emphasized guarding against the influences of pagan religions. Part of that process involved the people making, watch this, the right choices for themselves. I don't want you to miss this because from the Garden of Eden all the way to this day, God has always given man freedom of choice. He's always given us the ability to choose. On the one hand, we see God saying, I'm going to blot out your enemies. On the other hand, God says, I don't want you to take on the ways of your enemy. Moses warned Israel against becoming ensnared by the idols of the defeated nations by desiring the gold and the silver that they possessed. The question uh, we was, would the people choose God over the pagan gods 
of their enemies. Watch this. It's an issue that, that literally plagued the people of God even before they entered the land of promise. I need to remind you that the closing chapter of, of, uh, of Joshua ends with Joshua challenging the people to make a choice about who they're going to serve. Are you going to serve the gods of your fathers before the floods? Or are you going to serve the Lord God who gave us this land? And then he says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Can I tell you that even after God blesses people, sometimes they struggle to be faithful to God. God was literally warning his people. That the real challenge, I don't want you to miss this, the real challenge was not leaving Egypt. The real challenge was living in the promised land. Sometimes we're more faithful to God when we're struggling. I know I just said something. The point was that God didn't get rid of the bondage in Egypt for them to get themselves back in bondage in Canaan. Wait a minute, I didn't deliver you so that you could get yourself back in trouble. The truth is that they are surrounded by the influences of the enemy on a daily basis. And yet, here's the truth of our lives as well. Each one of us has a choice about how to live our life. Am I simply a Christian on Sunday? Or do I live for the Lord every day? True Christianity is the serious display of loyalty and fortitude that preserves us even when the world is trying to get us to give in. <laughs> You're not a good Christian just because you show up in church on Sunday. Christianity is how you live your life all week long. At another level, level, being a Christian is a choice that I have to make every day. Regardless of where I am, I am always God's child. That, that fact is one that should never elude me. My faith is neither strengthened nor diminished by my location or my situation. I, I've heard people say, well, if I could just get away from these influences, I would be better off. Could it be that God allows us to stay around the influences so that we can make the choice about whether we're going to give in to the influences or live for him? Why, God? On the one hand, you're telling me you're blotting out the enemy. On the other hand, you're telling me, don't let the enemy influence me. See, our lives should demonstrate that obeying God takes precedence over conforming to the ways and the wishes of others. It, it's not doing the right thing, that doing the right thing is always easy. Rather, our lives should put obeying God before doing what is, causes praise and acceptance from society. <laughs> we hear about peer pressure all the time. But one of the things I understand about peer pressure is that peer pressure is not just something we see in the public school system. It's not just a teenage thing. We got good and grown folks. I wish somebody would talk to me this morning. We got good and grown folks who give in to peer pressure because they're trying to be accepted by other folks. Can I tell somebody listening to me this morning, when you learn how to love who you are and who God made you to be, you won't worry about whether somebody else accepts you or not. People want to conform you so that you'll fit with who they want you to be. God wants to transform you. Transformation deals with the heart. It, ch it, it challenges our values and builds our conviction. Can I tell you that I would rather be transformed than conformed? It's not the, the enemies around me that pose the greatest danger. God has already declared that they are defeated. It's the enemy within us 
that we've got to learn how to overcome. I got to learn how to deal with what's going on inside of me. That gets me to the last thing, and that is that God wants to develop our strength. Here's what God says. God says, <laughs> says I, I, I will not drive them out before you in one year, lest the land become desolate and the wild beasts multiply against you. Little by little I will drive them out from before you until you have increased and possessed the land. Moses tells the Israelites that God would destroy the enemies, but not all at once. I'm, I'm going to get rid of them. Don't worry. They're going, but I'm not going to do it all at one time. It's going to happen little by little. In the same way and with the same power, God could miraculously and instantaneously change the situation. But how is Here's an interesting thing. Have you noticed that God doesn't do it all at once? The same God who gave victory in Egypt and in the territory east of the Jordan would also give victory in the land of Canaan. But God wasn't going to do it all at once. Rather, he's going to do it little by little. Somebody say little by little. The driving out of the enemy and the possession of the land are going to have to happen simultaneously. I don't want you to miss this. God says, you got to be ready to possess before I drive them out. God says, I'm going to drive them out, but I can't drive them out until you're ready to take possession. Wait a minute. As the enemy is being driven out, the people at the very same time need to be prepared to take possession of what the enemy has lost. In God's providence, one must, one must take place alongside of the other. The land was ready for them. I don't want y'all to miss this. The land was ready for them. That is a fact that the spies who went to Rahab's house learned. The issue was that the people weren't ready for the land. <laughs> if God wiped all the enemies out at once, it would produce a wilderness in which the wild animals would thrive. I don't want y'all to miss that. That's what God tells them. God says, I could, I could, I could. I could wipe them all out at one time, but it would be a problem for you if I did it. Because if I wipe them out all at once, you're not prepared to take possession of it. And wild beasts will fill the land. God, 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 God wants me to understand watch this that I'm not strong enough to go from one wilderness into another okay how quiet so let me put let me help you out the people are in the wilderness and God is saying if I wipe out your enemy and you're not prepared to fill the land, the land will become another wilderness. And you're not prepared to go from one wilderness to another. See, anything that I can't handle becomes something over which I lose control got to say that again. Anything I can't handle becomes something over which I lose control. <laughs> the moment I lose control, I am no longer exercising authority over it. Okay, let me help you out because every time y'all look at me like that, it makes me have to give another illustration. So let me give it an illustration. That's the danger of somebody having a child before they're ready. Because if you're not ready to parent a child, you will lose control over the child. And the child will end up ruling over you. Are y'all with me in here? 
See, see, he, he, here's this problem because the issue is not with the land. The issue is not with God. The issue is with the people. I don't want you to ignore the words until you have increased. God says there is some growing that has to happen with you before I can give you the land. In God's providence, strength comes through struggles. God left the enemy there so I can get stronger. God says until you've grown, I can't give you the land. You know, I wish spiritual growth was as simple as being able to quote scripture. Because we would have super saints all over the world. Because folks, I, <laughs> I've seen folks who can drop a scripture in just a breath. I mean, they just throw it out. But when it's time to live what you quoted, it becomes a real problem. See, spiritual growth is not my ability to quote the word of God. Spiritual growth is my ability to live the word of God. As they gradually make their way through the land of Canaan, winning victory after victory, the people of God were going to grow in their faith and learn better how to trust God. But watch this. They were going to have to do it on God's timetable, not on their own. As I said in the opening of this message, this is yet another reminder that not all of God's blessings are going to be instantaneous. There are some situations that can only be worked out over time. There are some things that I've learned that I have got to be better prepared to handle. Perhaps the worst thing that can ever happen, I got to say this, perhaps the worst thing that can ever happen in a person's life is to get a blessing ahead of time. I don't know how many times I've heard people shout over what God did for them and then made it, messed it up before you know it. See, God knows what you need and God knows when you need it. There are things that you aren't going to going to be able to handle until you have increased. You got to grow. And this isn't an issue with the blessing. The problem is not, is not being prepared to handle the blessing. What, what started as a blessing can turn into a mess if you haven't increased. <laughs> as a pastor, gosh, I I, 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 I've been doing this for over 30 years. And one of the things I've learned as a pastor is that time in church don't mean you've grown in God. Preach, pastor. I've, I've seen folks who are just where they were when they first walked down the aisle because they have yet to increase. And that's why I want to encourage you to stop trying to rush God's schedule. Stop trying to push God to move early. God has heard your prayers. He knows your heart. But God also knows what you're ready to handle. God knows when we're ready to handle what he has for us. There, there's somebody here who's listening to me who can look back over your life and you can thank God that he didn't give it to you when you were asking for it. There are times when God has to build my capacity so that I can handle what he's prepared for me. But capacity is about so much more than space. I know when we think of that word capacity, we're thinking, God, I just need to have more space. No, no, no. Capa capacity is a reflection of my mental and spiritual maturity. Capacity is a reflection of my focus and determination. Capacity is a reminder of my need for grace and humility. Can I tell you that, watch this, there are some folks that they can't handle a blessing because when they get blessed, they get too big for their own britches. 
rather than expecting instant spiritual maturity and solutions to our problems, God is calling on us to slow down, work life out one step at a time. Trust that God is going to make up the difference between where I am and where he intends for me to be. This is going to be a step-by-step process. And in the end, I'm glad God doesn't do it all at once because I don't know if I could handle if God gave me the blessing all at once. I pondered uh, this passage. I thought to myself, in the midst of this passage, God says, if you'll just do what I told you to do the way I told you to do it, God says, not only will I blot out your enemies, I'll make sure there's no sickness among the people. God says, I will make sure you walk in divine health just by staying in line with me. I thought about this passage, and I thought about it in the context of COVID-19. How many folks have been trying to rush the schedule? How many have been trying to step ahead of God? How many have been trying to force their way? Could it be that God wants us to slow down and move step by step? Stop trying to get ahead of God. Could it be that God is calling our attention to the fact that there's unnecessary sickness simply because there's an unwillingness to walk in obedience. (laughs) But for those who feel like God isn't moving fast enough, for those who just want to name it and claim it, gab it and grab it, I got news for you. I don't care how much you name and claim, gab and grab, God is still going to do it in his own time. You can't hurry, God. You just have to wait. You got to trust him and give him time no matter how long it takes. He's a God that you can't hurry. He'll be there. You don't have to worry. He may not come when you want him, but is there anybody that knows? He'll be right on time. When you you grow to that place, when you've increased, God says, I'll start releasing blessings into your life because then I'll know you're ready to handle it. All I'm telling you is God's going to do it, but he's going to do it little by little. God, I thank you for reminding us that it's not going to come all at once. Sometimes there will be weeks and months, even years, before we come into all that you have for us. But remind us that it's about us building our own capacity. It's about us being prepared to receive what God has for us.
Don't let us step ahead of you. We want to follow you every step of the way. <laughs> Your word declares the steps of a good man are ordered by you. And he delights in his way. Thank you, God, for ordering our steps. For that person who's gripped with anxiety, who's been looking at their calendar and saying, I want this to happen and I want it to happen now, God, remind us that we're to be anxious for nothing. But in all things, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, we're to make our requests known to you, and your peace will guard our hearts and minds. Thank you for reminding. If you're here today and don't know Christ in the pardoning of your sin and you're saying, what must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. If you're saved and you're saying, Pastor, I know I'm saved. I've got a relationship, but I'm out of fellowship. The Bible says God is just and faithful to forgive us of our sins, to cleanse us. The Lord has moved in your spirit and said, this is the place I want you to set down your spiritual roots to become all that I've ordained for you to be. The Bible says, the day you hear my voice, harden not your heart to. Wherever you are, we invite you to come this day from wherever you are. In Jesus' name. Amen. We've done as God has commanded us to do, and yet there is room. Again, I pray somebody's been blessed by the word of God this day. Let's prepare for our offering and let's pray together out of love and obedience to your word. We bring our tithes and offerings to you. We joyfully accept and believe in your priorities and promises. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have room enough for it. I will prevent pests from devouring your crops, and the vines in your fields will not cast their fruit, says the Lord Almighty. As a result of our faith and obedience to your word, we ask that you open, unlock heaven to give us the provisions we need for our life, and the perspective we need for our desires and destiny will take us beyond our greatest aspiration. Protect, cover everything that we currently have, and don't allow the enemy to abort anything that you have predestined to give us in the future. The tithe and offering is what we owe. Sacrificial giving are the seeds we sow. You will give more seed to those who sow. When we give generously, we will reap generously. We have the power to determine our financial harvest, and so we sow with the expectation of jobs and better jobs, raises and bonuses, houses and land, debt free territory for your glory. We now give out of our faith and trust in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Listen, as we close today, I want you to be mindful of a couple of things. One, I want you to be in prayer for the folks in, uh, in the Northeast who are facing a hurricane over the next uh, 24 hours. Uh, we deal with that stuff on a regular basis. <coughs> That's not something they're used to. Their houses aren't made for it. So I want you to be in prayer uh, for them. Also, if uh, you happen to have brought items for uh, Haiti Relief, um, just bring them into the lobby and uh, we'll have the box to put those things in uh, after uh, we dismiss today. The grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God, the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit, restful and abide with these, his people, 
both now, henceforth, and forever. Amen.